Hello everybody, welcome to another episode with Mondays with Mate. Today we are going to talk about our batteries and how we choose our battery cells and stuff like that based on your questions. And don't forget to post the questions for the next episode because you can win this amazing mug. I was a petrol head from early on. Basically, my parents tell me stories that I was crazy about cars before I could walk or talk. And there is no reason for it. I don't know the reason. Like, my family didn't have anything to do with cars. So I was just somehow born with an obsession for cars since ever. And I, I was also very interested in technology and electronics. And being from Croatia, I read a lot about Nikola Tesla, who was also born here and he invented the AC induction motor. And I was always fascinated by him and his motor, so I was wondering why nobody was using this perfect machine that's so much better than a combustion engine to make a car that's exciting. So not just environmentally friendly or efficient. So I thought if you use the advantages and the potential of the electric machine, that you can make a car that's better. Not only electric, but actually in many things, not in all, better. For example, with four motors, you can do things that are not possible with a traditional powertrain. You can control each wheel separately. You can accelerate one and break the others all at different rates. And the next millisecond, you can already be the other way around and stuff like that. Batteries are not the goal. They are a means to the goal. They are a necessary evil, so to say, because if you compare them with the previous energy storage device of cars, which is basically the fuel tank, they have a 50 times worse, 50 to 100 times actually worse um, energy content per kilogram. So batteries come a long way and they are at an inflection point where you can make, let's say, a viable electric car at the moment, but only because the electric motor is so good. Because the combustion engine car wastes most of that energy that's stored in the fuel tank because the efficiency of the combustion engine is 25 to 35 percent while the electric motor is 19 95 percent efficient so you use the energy much better but you have a lot less of it and the powertrain is smaller it's more compact for a given power but the energy storage device so from the fuel tank to the battery is much worse so i'm not a huge fan of batteries at the moment uh, they can improve a lot and they should improve a lot but because the motors are so good, because the electric powertrain is on such a high level compared to the combustion engine, it kind of makes sense now. So we are in, at an inflection point where it, we can create the car, where putting all of that together, the advantages of the electric motor and the disadvantages of the battery, it makes sense. One of the things that defines the C2 battery is that it has to deliver a lot of power, 1.4 megawatt, but at the same time have a high energy density to deliver the range. So we can make very high power density batteries, like for example, Koenigsegg and Aston Martin battery are extremely high power density, but they have a combustion engine and a fuel tank, so they don't need the energy for the range. So they have extremely high power density, but relatively low energy density. The C2 has to have both a high power density and a high energy density, which makes it quite complicated. And then the battery has other jobs as well. It has, has to be integrated in the shape of the car. So the packaging is very difficult or we were fighting for every millimeter there. And as you can see in the battery, it's not a simple skateboard shape, just a box like some other car companies do. It's more complex because we wanted to not have the battery under the seat and so on for packaging reasons because we wanted the car lower. Some general characteristics of the batteries are that it has 120 kilowatt hours of energy, uh, which is a lot of energy for a sports car. And at the same time, this 120 kilowatt hours is capable to deliver 1.4 megawatts of power peak for a short period of time. Cooling is a very important part uh, of any battery, especially for such a high performance car. We use many different cooling concepts in many different projects. So for example, we have a submerged uh, cooling system, which basically submerges the battery cells in a non-conductive liquid, which is uh, a polymer-based liquid. But in the C2, we don't do that for weight reasons and packaging reasons. So it's actually cooled by a mixture of glycol and water. So pretty, let's say conventional, but the way we cool it is quite different than other uh, car companies. So we are more cooling, let's say, the top and the bottom of the cell and not the side of the cell because the cell we use 21700 cylindrical cells the jelly roll is wound into the um, casing of the cylindrical cell and that means that the uh, heat is spreading 
uh, from the center of the cells towards the ends, so more axial than radial. That's why we call the ends of the battery rather than the side walls of the battery, because we think that's more effective. And we have 6,980 of these little 21700 cells inside of the battery pack. The collaboration with the OEMs is very important for us, so we are not going against the industry, we are going with the industry, like trying to get this transition from combustion engines to hybrids and electrics together and trying to help as many companies as possible. So, of course, you know that uh, we have Porsche and Hyundai and Kia as shareholders, so we also do a bunch of projects together, um, developing various cars together, some of that is public, some of that is not. And also it's public that we work with Aston Martin, Koenigsegg, Pininfarina and a lot of other car companies that I can't talk about yet. But why do they all come to us? Well, we started pretty early to focus on high performance uh, electric powertrains. So it's a lot of effort and know-how that we have created in uh, high energy density, high power density batteries and high power density powertrain systems. And being a small company, and being able to develop the whole system from the first idea from a white sheet of paper until the final product and then also producing it makes us quite unique. And being still more flexible and faster than the large companies uh, makes us attractive for the big companies because we can develop stuff very quickly. And I think uh, one thing that makes us quite unique is that we are also a car company. So when we develop our own cars, we are not put in a box by big car companies. We can do whatever we want. We can go creative and crazy as much as we want, like building a 1.4 megawatt hypercar, and we can develop new technologies there, showcase them in the best way possible, not some kind of showcase or whatever, but in an actual car. And with that, we promote what is possible. We set the bar very high, and then we can use this technology for other OEMs. So that's what, what's, what makes us very interesting for them. They already see the stuff that they could do and that gives them their own ideas what they could, where they could apply these technologies and then they want the same things for themselves in some other applications. Maybe not in a supercar, but in an SUV or a compact sports car or something like that. We got a lot of questions about graphene batteries and uh, improvements in battery technology. And that's a question I get very often, uh, also in person and over the last 10 years that I'm doing this. People send me articles about this new battery, about that new battery. And this is actually my notebook uh, that's I think more than 12 years old, where I wrote uh, initially everything down, like all the different concepts I had in my head, all the different uh, ideas I had. And I have the battery specifications from that time here as well. At that time, about 10 years ago, Panasonic also brought out its 3.4 amp hour 18650 cell, which had about 240 watt hours per kilogram uh, gravimetric energy density. And today, 10 years later, the cells that are on the market are at around, like the best ones are at around like 270 watt hours per kilogram. So it didn't improve that much. What really improved is the price drop per kilowatt hour. So it dropped really dramatically in the last 10 years. But in terms of the performance of the cells, in terms of energy density, it improved a little bit. And there you can see all the time some kind of articles popping up, companies claiming wild stuff like a battery that can recharge in one minute or a battery that can be recharged 10,000 times. So battery has many characteristics that it needs to be good at. For example, you have gravimetric energy density, which means how much energy you have per unit of mass, watt hours per kilogram, for example. You have volumetric energy density, cycle life, meaning how many times you can charge and recharge the battery cell. Uh, you have calendar life, so how cell ages, regardless of charging and discharging, so just by time. You have cost, of course, which is usually measured in dollars per kilowatt hour. You have uh, safety, so depending on how uh, safe the, or how stable the chemistry is, what will happen in a case of an accident, of overcharge, over discharge. So all of these things are very important. And you can have a battery chemistry that's really good at one thing, like for example, uh, charge time, but really sucks at the others. But of course, the articles will focus the headline on that one thing that will really stand out and ignore the other things where the cell is quite bad at. I've been reading these articles and those promises for years and years, but to the market, you know, from lab level to the market, there is not much 
that actually came to the market and I don't see it happening anytime soon. Maybe the closest thing to coming to market are solid state batteries, which will be interesting for some applications and they could bring costs down and improve energy density, but I don't think that they will be relevant for high performance applications for quite some time because the internal resistance uh, should be not really on the level of current high performance battery cells. And what has changed as well is um, the battery pack architectures. So the cell chemistries, the fundamentals didn't change that much, but the cooling concepts, the safety of the battery packs, the packaging efficiencies uh, has improved a lot over the 10 years. What will happen in the next years? Who knows? You have lithium air technologies, lithium metal, solid state, uh, graphene and so on. And there is lots of promises being made, lots of claims. And it's the same thing today and 10 years ago. But I don't think that we will see these, let's say, big fundamental shifts in the next three or four years. Thanks for tuning in, for listening to the technical stuff and have a great week.